Sometime before 1846, someplace near Walden Pond, Massachusetts, Henry David Thoreau wrote this. To every thousand hacking at the branches of evil, there is but one who is striking at the root. Now, on January 20th, 2010, one year after Barack Obama was sworn into office, and one day before the Supreme Court decided Citizens United, our democracy was already broken. Long before anybody even heard of the ideas that were, be ar that were argued and dissolved in this decision, this idea of unlimited corporate speech, our democracy had already been corrupted. And my deepest fear, as I see the thousands of people around this country who have been angered by this decision, and who have focused their energy at the idea that somehow we have to overturn this decision, my fear is we are going to overturn this decision and go back to where we were on January 20th, 2010, when our democracy was already broken. I've got a timeline. Because the core, the root, the problem here has of course been exacerbated by this insane doctrine <coughs> launched by the Supreme Court on January 21st. Of course, the problem is much worse. And of course, the problem finds its root in exactly the story which Tom tells and others tell of this insane way that corporations found themselves in the bosom of the Civil War amendments. We thought the amendments were about liberating African Americans. It turned out they were about protecting corporations. Of course, all of that is insane. But if we fixed those two problems, we still would be nowhere close to fixing the problem that has destroyed this democracy. Now that problem is precisely the problem that Zephyr has described. Zephyr is one of the most important scholars framing the problem in a way that our country could address. In her paper cited by Justice Stevens in dissent, what she got us to recognize is that the framers had a rich conception of corruption, much richer than the kind of Rob Blagojevich quid pro quo corruption that animates our thinking today. Their conception of corruption, as she described it, was any system or person, Jane Austen was also into this deeply, any system or person that developed the wrong kind of dependence now, that doesn't mean to be dependent is to be corrupted. After all, we want courts that are dependent upon the law. Independent judiciary does not mean courts that can do whatever the hell they want. It means courts dependent upon the law. An independent judiciary has the right kind of dependency. And the framers of our Constitution when they put the jewel of our democracy in Article I of the Constitution, described in Federalist 52, the kind of dependency our democracy was supposed to have. As Federalist 52 put it, a dependency upon the people alone. An independent democracy, an independent Congress, is a Congress that is dependent upon the people alone. Now, nothing could be more obvious about our current political system than that we have a set of representatives, both candidates and incumbents, who have developed a radically different dependency. 
a dependency upon their funders. They spend between 30 and 70 percent of their life as candidates or representatives on the phone calling people to raise money to get to Congress. They develop a sixth sense about what their funders want and they begin to bend their behavior towards their conception of what their funders want. Representative Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress first, a colleague of hers said to her, always lean to the green. And as she comments, he was no environmentalist. <laughs> They develop a sense of exactly how they should bend their policies to keep their funders happy so that they can raise the money that they or their party needs to get back to Congress, and even to keep their funders happy so that when they leave Congress, they have a nice, cushy job on K Street as a lobbyist. As Jim Cooper, a Democrat from Tennessee, puts it, Congress has become a farm league for K Street. They live their life imagining that this government service is a temporary job on their way to million dollar salaries as lobbyists on K Street. That is a dependency. It's not a dependency of evil people. It's, it's not Rob Lagojevich. It is actually good people who are in a system where they can't help but be pulled in the wrong direction by this dependency. Think of the alcoholic father or alcoholic mother each morning waking up hoping they have the strength to do the right thing, but by the end of the day pulled by their dependency towards something they don't want to have to do, but they can't help themselves because of this dependency. This dependency, think of it literally in the sense of a chemical dependency, is what has corrupted our democracy. Though just as we know with the alcoholic, might be facing the worst problems in the world, might be losing his liver, his job, his family. These are the worst problems he could have. We know with the alcoholic, he will not solve any of those problems until he solves his alcoholism first. And we know the same thing about the dependency that corrupts our Congress. We will not solve any of the problems that we associate with our government until we solve this dependency first, this corruption, this distortion, this focus on what funders want rather than what on citizens want. That is our problem. Now let me tell you about a hero of this fight man who started Stride Right, you should go out and buy Keds tomorrow, it's Arnie Hyatt. Arnie Hyatt in 1996 was the second largest contributor to the Democratic Party. <coughs> Bill Clinton in 1997 invited the 30 top contributors to the Democratic Party to a dinner. And in that dinner, he asked each of these contributors to tell the president what he should do in the last years of his administration. And so each of the fat cats stood up and told the president what the president should do. Arnie was the last to speak. And Arnie said, Mr. President, I know you're an admirer of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, so I want you to put yourself in Franklin Roosevelt's shoes in 1939, when he realized he needed to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. Because you, Mr. President, have to do the same thing. You have to convince a reluctant nation to wage a war to save democracy. Not a war against fascists, a war against fat cats, people like us. People who believe that just because we are wealthy, we have the right to tell the government what the government should do. Just because we're wealthy, we can pick up a phone and get any senator or president on the line. We are the people you have to fight against, and you have to convince America to save its democracy from us. 
Now, as you can imagine, in that room of 30 fat cats, <laughs> there was a certain silence. Arnie sat down. The only published account that we have of the evening describes President Clinton cutting Arnie Hyatt to pieces. Fourteen years after Arnie had the courage to stand up to that president, we need to recognize and celebrate that it was Arnie who was right and the president who was wrong. We need to celebrate the idea that he humbly suggested to the most powerful man in the world, but we also need to recognize the way in which Arnie was wrong. Arnie thought we should go to the politicians and tell the politicians they should change themselves. It is never going to work like that. The reason this event is so important, and if I can say the reason the Tea Party is so important, I, I understand. I'm saying the Tea Party as well. The reason the Tea Party is so important is that it represents people who are saying we want to take back control of this government from them. Now, we don't share, I don't share, the objectives of the Tea Party in their substantive policy in many contexts. But we need to recognize, though we don't have common ends, we have a common enemy. And we need to build this movement of people who are organizing and teaching each other the root against which we must strike. Thank you very much.